Hello, uh, Jolan uh, and uh, the whole uh, European uh, team. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this space for exploration. For us, uh, it is a very novel topic and we are very much looking into a discussion with, with, with the audience. So yes, uh, the stars are in the panel and also outside the panel. Thank you for the introduction, Jolan, again. This um, panel is about citizen engagement at universities, but also outside universities. We bring open innovation as a, uh, as a key point of understanding how society uh, can help uh, to, in the support of cultural heritage preservation, especially in, uh, in crisis uh, situations. Uh, why, why does citizen engagement matter? Uh, first, because we believe that citizens, when I say we, uh, I, I refer to all the uh, speakers today and beyond, uh, we, we think that citizens are agents of change in their communities, not uh, just individuals, but real agents of uh, change. Digital technologies is a, is a means to empower uh, these agents of change that citizens are. And uh, the community dimension of cultural heritage preservation is for us very, very important beyond any institutional commitment into um, preservation and uh, protection. Okay, uh, it's fun. Citizen engagement is fun, of course, but what, what, what do we mean, especially in the framework of today's um, panel? Uh, first, it's about acknowledging uh, user uh, requirements understanding the needs and uh, catering to these needs. Um, then we understand citizen, citizen engagement in terms of contribution, active involvement in cultural heritage pro projects. And then uh, as, a, as a value in the way institutions understand social participation when embedding uh, citizen engagement in their actions. So that's uh, how uh, we we think that uh, these uh, the, these um, uh, these these talks fit into this panel today. Uh, Daniele will talk to us about um, acknowledging uh, the user requirements in digital cultural heritage products and services. Then uh, Bente and Alex uh, by adopting uh, the the point of view of uh, citizen engagement, also citizen science as well. I will talk about um, a citizen enhanced remote sensing, Bente, and citizen cartographers, volunteers, contributing data to open source uh, geographical uh, sites. Uh, and then in, in, in the level of em embracing citizen engagement as a trigger to institutional change, we have two talks. Uh, Isber about community engagement in preservation in the Arab countries and Stephanie and myself about the um, Ukrainian war. Why is citizen engagement important in action taking? Uh, these are two last slides uh, on my side. Uh, that has been a blog post uh, by Stephanie and myself. Um, now is the time for action taking. And now uh, we think that it's crucial to really not only talk about citizen engagement, but embed it in, in um, our mainstream activities. Um, uh, it, is, it is now the time where technology plays a very important role in engaging diaspora also in, um, in, in social participation. What we saw in Ukraine, and we'll be happy to, to, to see that at, at Stefania's talk, is that diaspora, uh, so Ukrainians abroad, uh, were uh, a catalyst in, in helping cultural health and preservation along with volunteers, non-Ukrainian. Non um, now is the time for citizen engagement because activism is such an important, uh, it's, it's, it's a cornerstone in, in mainstream activity. At least we, we believe that activism is very important in many types and themes uh, going from environment, social justice, all sorts of social purposes. So cultural heritage should be also addressed in terms of activism. Uh, and also it's about immediacy. Here I cite Andrea Segerberg from uh, Sucho Initiative that you know, uh, you have heard perhaps Sebastian yesterday, if you do not act once, the materials risk disappearing. This has happened in Ukraine and we have 
examples of of the the, the, the value of uh, urgent um, uh, action that took um, place and because it was immediate it was uh, very powerful and of course useful and um, action taking means also bridging um, dichotomies in terms of cultural values and uh, community bonds. Mm, some projects that deal with easily enhanced citizen engagement uh, if you want to have a look, and uh, I would like now to hand over to the da Daniele. Good morning to everybody. My name is Daniele Spizzichino. I am an engineer. I'm a researcher of the Geological Survey of Italy. I work in ISPRA. And uh, today we try to, to make some uh, advice concerning the, the Italian uh, coordination activity of the European Cultural Heritage Task Force. No? That uh, during the last uh, the last uh, two, two two years. But before start of this uh, my speech, I want to remember that this uh, this path was uh, st started in uh, 2017 with the first Copernicus for Cultural Heritage uh, um, workshop, and uh, I I have the honor to participate to speak in this in this uh, in this workshop. And at the end of this workshop, we define some uh, general uh, homework no, for the next uh, year no? and uh, we have some items some highlight uh, depending from the the three more most important domain no? the domain of cultural heritage we noted that all the uh, countries at european level but also national level needs collection and the implementation of a digital database for each cultural heritage. So in terms of number, typology, location, and so on. Uh, considering the other domain, no? uh, it's important to have the availability of homogeneous and harmonized map at national level no? for different uh, hazard scenario, considering landslide, earthquake, subsidence, flood, and so on. And we noticed that the satellite in space segment uh, can provide uh, a value support in this uh, forecasting model, in this uh, risk scenario, okay? So we can pass uh, following this uh, uh, framework from the static map to a dynamic uh, integrated scenario. This is the was very important. So what's going to happen after this uh, highlight uh, in five years ago? That uh, the European Commission start uh, no, uh, and propose the institution of a task force uh, to investigate this, uh, the opportunity of uh, satellite data and monitoring to support uh, this, uh, this, this scenario. No? So uh, the task force was composed by a member state and was uh, um, conducted by the, uh, the coordinated conduct by e e Italy and chaired by the Italian Ministry of Cal Culture. The main activity started from a, a previous report that was uh, uh, developed by PricewaterhouseCoopers that was uh, delivered in 2018. And uh, we have the, 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 the activity to, to uh, analyze and implement in, um, uh, in more detail this report. In fact, we defined this uh, timetable and this uh, uh, map, roadmap. No? So we have different meetings and we have to, uh, let me say, to map the user needs uh, in the Earth observation domain behind the one identified by the PricewaterhouseCoopers um, uh, report. Okay? So we have to complement, filter, aggregate, and quantify all these user needs into a specific requirements. No? After that, we analyze how existing Copernicus data, service, and product uh, could satisfy uh, this requirement. No? And at the end, we have to identify possible uh, announcement and customize this Copernicus product. Copernicus, of course, is uh, the uh, um, European satellite program for the Earth observation. And um, so at the end, we have to analyze a uh, possible synergy with national level to the European trust edition or uh, international solution to fill the gaps uh, uh, that we notice in the report. So at the end, the, the, the targets uh, of this uh, work was to consolidate the user needs and define dimensional uh, requirement, both in temporal and spatial resolution validate the best one of the three hypotheses envisaged by the PricewaterhouseCoopers study for accessing Copernicus data by the cultural heritage user community. 
so we can keep the current system for access to the data by cultural heritage users, provide cultural heritage users with a, a new interface to collect data from different core services from different satellites, or create a new services, uh, uh, especially for the, for the user. So as I told you before, we start to collect all the needs now uh, from the uh, cultural heritage community. So we uh, collect the needs uh, came from uh, uh, urban change monitoring, land change monitoring, site effect, uh, site area buffer zone, uh, land change monitoring, geohazard, touristic pressure. So all the needs uh, that was expressed by, expressed by the uh, cultural heritage community. We collect all this data. We uh, fill the gap uh, and also analyze in which uh, services of the program Copernicus, these data are already available maybe not with the same uh, spatial or temporal resolution, but we try to cover if there are uh, these data are existing. Uh, for example, a considerable number of the identifier requirements are already satisfied for by the Copernicus core services product. We also analyze if this uh, product are having a coverage, a European coverage or pan European or global coverage, no? to, to, to understand how to, to, to implement. You can find all these uh, information in a specific publication that I will uh, uh, give you at the end of my presentation. But one of the most important thing is that uh, we are able to collect all the requirements through the service actually uh, available uh, by each parameter to each parameter. So uh, with this map, you know that if you need the, some specific parameter, you can find this in a very core services to fulfill some specific need in terms of uh, parameter to monitoring. Okay, so it's a very important publication because it, it, it gives you a very important overview of what is uh, already exist at European level uh, from digital, technical, and you know satellite data and services product uh, can support the, the cultural heritage uh, conservation and monitoring. But I want to spend something about the Italian situation. So, Caterina, when we are at minutes, yes, two, two, minutes. two minutes. Yes, so thank in, you. In, yes, in Italy, we you know exactly where are our cultural heritage, the location, and we have a lot of good mapping uh, of others. So we, now we are able to define exactly the expose the exposure or, and vulnerability of our uh, um, heritage to specific hazard. So we have uh, some uh, hub to analyze and to define uh, the seismic landslide and flood hazard. Our ministry are developing this sort of knowledge app, and we are trying to use satellite data from radar. This is a uh, INSAR analysis at, at three regional level, and we can use also uh, analysis at national level. So we are passing uh, in Italy from static view to dynamic view using uh, these, uh, these, uh, these services and products. So the uh, final remarks, uh, a European Cultural Heritage Advisory Board uh, composed of experts uh, represented from all EU members should be established to advise the Copernicus user from about cultural heritage user needs. It's important uh, to have a ready to use integrated information. Uh, there is a high potential uh, for Copernicus to stimulate the growth of cultural heritage downstream services. Uh, the access sometimes to very high resolution is not uh, easy, at least. And we can also uh, implement the Copernicus Academy network to support a new generation with specific academic course on cultural heritage and earth observation. So um, I finish, I try to give you a, an overview concerning the possibility that uh, earth observation applied to cultural heritage can promote and support, no? the uh, uh, implementation of forecasting risk uh, scenario. Thank you for your attention and for the short time. Perfect, Daniele, thank you very much. Uh, all slides and the recording, of course, will be shared at the end. Let me please hand over to Alex uh, Papadopoulos, DePaul University, US. And uh, Alex also belongs to the UNESCO Cultural Health Threats uh, team. Welcome, Alex, please. Hello, everybody. Let me share my screen. There we go. So many things. Um, right. Uh, just, uh, just extraordinarily um, 
excited about uh, your presentation, Daniela, and, and what I think we're gonna see in my uh, short presentation is the additive value of taking that institutionally produced uh, data and augmenting it and maybe providing new categories uh, of data for, um, uh, for making uh, determinations about um, uh, cultural heritage uh, protection. All right, I think I got it now. Um, so our project is assessment and mitigation of Anthropocene threats to cultural heritages, a threat slash risk mitigation spatial model rubric and people's atlas. Uh, the Anthropocene of cultural heritage protection involves collaborative and often contestatory actions that include visioning, negotiating, planning, and implementing, and managing cultural heritage projects in a world of anthropogenic or anthropocentric threats. The Anthropocene impacts human communities unequally, such is the case with our cultural heritages. Decolonizing cultural heritage threat identification and assessment is imperative. The cultural heritages of women and sexual communities, communities of color, indigenous groups and First Nations, non charter group ethnic minorities, the economically marginalized, the politically silenced, and those bereft of environmental justice have too often been systematically denied access to media and digital resources, among others, that would allow them to exercise cultural heritage claims participate equitably in their regulation and benefit socially and economically from their management. So identifying such threats, assessing their character and magnitude, devising mitigation strategies, and most importantly, democratizing the computational process of threat identification would greatly contribute to community-based insecurity and equity. Now, I'm a geographer. So my perspective is, uh, is spatial. Continuous advantage in geotechnology support ever more, so geotechnology support ever more granular site data acquisition. The desired outcome here is to democratize these processes and create a technological scaffold that would allow members of the public, what we call citizen cartographers, to become active agents in the target site definition, data acquisition, and report phases of the proposed geographic information system that will support a dynamic people's atlas of threats and risks to cultural heritages. I should add there is a very significant analytical phase uh, to this. And clearly this is collaborative, a collaborative initiative between uh, peoples and, uh, and uh, peoples cartographers or citizen cartographers and, uh, and academia. The work has two objectives. Um, look at uh, the uh, spider uh, graphic on the upper left. Objective one uh, is the model and rubric. Uh, objective is to refine our threats, uh, threats and risk mitigation draft model and rubric. Um, the mock-up here illustrates the systemic and polysemic character of the threat environment and proposes a rubric and measurement for assessing the spectrum of risks and hazards it precipitates. For example, just to make it uh, incandescently clear here, uh, this is the mock-up that does not describe a real situation, but as we would be reading it, or rather the way we would be re reading it is that uh, communication representation threats uh, would be at the highest level in this particular case, representing failure, systemic failure or loss. And at the other opposite, at the opposite end, we see that uh, there is really no technological uh, uh, threat or hazard involved in this particular case. Now, the surface that is created by these uh, scores would give us uh, clearly a rough, right, a rough way of, uh, of quantifying, uh, quantifying risk. And 
The same on the mitigation side. Again, the character of mitigation strategies is polysemic. Um, figure two demonstrates the interdependencies of risk mitigating goals and strategies as actionable opportunities. We propose collaborative, inter and multidisciplinary academic and policy actions that build on an understanding of such complexes. Now, that was objective one, kind of creating this scaffold. Alex, uh, I, I'm not sure we have the time to go through all the objectives, but if you want to wrap up with a sentence, we'll be very glad to hear. One sentence, oh boy. Or two, um, go ahead. Right, all right. The proposed atlas is distinguished by the use of an expanded definition of risks and threats to cultural heritages, the application of the threat model and rubric being developed by the research team, and three, the development of an original GIS engine that can support citizen participation in the interactive editable web application that elements and builds the People's Atlas dynamically. And there you have it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. Let me please uh, introduce, uh, we have three more exciting uh, speakers. Stay in touch, don't move uh, people. Uh, I would like to introduce you, Ben B. Earth observation and data policy and data management expert. Bente runs a research and consultancy company, BLB, from Norway. Thank you, Bente, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me and nice to meet uh, all of you. Uh, I will share my screen, yes. Let's see how this works. You should be able to see it. So, uh, I will be talking about how citizens' contributions can improve and enhance uh, remote sensing data to manage the cultural heritage threats in conflict areas in particular. So uh, you have already heard uh, from uh, Daniele how um, rich our access to satellite data and remote sensing data is. But um, we also need to have more detailed information on ground, not only in times of conflict, but particularly in time of, times of conflict, if you want to um, be able to manage uh, the threats of the cultural heritage. And the new, uh, I mean, the, the new concept here, if you like, is the combination of several sources, including these contributions from, from the citizens. And this is, by the way, I have uh, many, many pictures of, from Ukraine. This is the Kiev area, in case you wondered. And it's Copernicus who uh, gathered his uh, satellite images. I'm speaking on behalf of uh, this team here. And you see Katerina is here and also Stefania. She's among us in this, um, in this event. Uh, but we also have uh, Yuvanka Glikoska, who is a full stack developer. So we sort of cover the different um, uh, disciplines uh, to, to a certain extent in the team that worked on this project. Uh, satellite images, through satellite images, we can detect change. And here, this is a late example. Uh, I used one from the US in this case, from Landsat, using Landsat satellites, and you see the uh, very impressive flooding from uh, in, in Pakistan lately. And you can very clearly see uh, there's an impact. So this is the space view. But, and we uh, then need to get in touch with the people on ground. And in this case, uh, we uh, already had um, established a contact. Uh, we means web to learn in particularly coordinating this. So we, there was contact with organizations and individuals, both uh, inside Ukraine and also Ukrainians outside Ukraine, um, that were interested in, um, in supporting the, the protection of the cultural heritage. And you will learn more about this uh, later. So what can citizens do? And in Ukraine, they already started to collect information. And uh, I... I this was the background for us, and you will learn more about it, so just so you know. And the uh, Earth observations we want to then use is, to, uh, is, is also to include a participatory digital action, 
as um, Katarina likes to call it. And, and I think you, you, you not only get the information, but you also get the, the human uh, interactions and engagement, which is also very important to, to have with you to, in order to be successful with in, in such a crisis situation. So the citizens observations, we uh, got access to in Ukraine where local um, networks of sensors uh, for the diverse of, um, variables, but particularly we were looking at air quality. So, uh, it, and, and I want to add that there were also uh, information not only collected by this, um, how should I, citizens network of sensors, so, so private individuals setting up sensors, but it was combined also with public um, and administrative uh, information. So we looked at different scenarios. We looked at uh, scenarios where we had an, a direct uh, impact on our beloved uh, cultural heritage. Uh, we looked at indirect impact. It could be, you know, we have our fires, you hit maybe a factory with some nasty stuff in it that is the detrimental to your cultural heritage. That was another uh, scenario. And thirdly, um, indirect via ground motion, you know, when you have huge impact close to um, a building or something that actually it can also impact the building. And you also have this, uh, we didn't talk too much about it, but when you have flooding or drought or whatever, you, you, you actually influence uh, motions uh, or you can ignite uh, movement on ground. So, uh, we had uh, a combination, we combined then recorded war crimes, as it's called, and it was the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine that collected, that, that set up a page where you, the citizens could uh, deposit <laughs> their uh, images of local sites. So that's the in situ observations. And, and you already heard, we have so many different Copernicus uh, data we can combine with. And here we also got access to two um, citizens run, uh, I would say, um, networks of sensors for air quality. And we combined it also with, um, with Galileo and Egnos. And you already, I think Daniela already showed the European Ground Motion Service. Um, currently it's not covering Ukraine uh, publicly, because this is also sensitive information, we have to remember that. But the point is that we um, set up to combine all this. And this was done in uh, a, um, a hackathon where we uh, did the first work with the same team. Then this data needed to be prepared. And here is the, the tricky part. You need to set up harvesters and workers, you know, the technical setup. And we used open, open software again, CCAN, uh, to uh, catalog the data and prepare the data. And you see here how it looks like. And um, the next question then is how do we present it? Uh, we need to harmonize the, you know, you the many different types of data. Uh, you don't necessarily have standards. Uh, you need to have them interoperable in many different ways. And so harmonization of the data in order before you can present it in a way that can be used. So you get from the, from, from the citizens. Now the next step is how do you present it so that the information they have been gathering together with the satellites, data, et cetera, how can they make use of it again? That's the next step. And uh, the devil's in the details. Uh, so we are working on this um, uh, still to find a nice way of presenting it so that it it can be useful. And so then we have to go to back. We have to go back to the users. So I have listed here the cultural heritage managers. Of course, they have their own user requirements or their their preferred way of looking at it. Uh, from security, so securing the building, there are risk connections connected to damage of the cultural heritage, and of course, the citizens themselves. And if you're interested in, in connecting with us, we are more than happy to work with you. So please contact either Katharina or me here uh, on these this, um, emails. Thank you very much.
Wonderful, Bente. Thank you very much, too. Let me please uh, introduce you, introduce the next speaker. This is Isber Sabrin. Uh, Isber is a Syrian archaeologist specializing in cultural heritage management. Uh, Isber is currently the chair and co-founder of the international NGO Heritage for Peace. We have been uh, following Isber's uh, work for the last two years. It's the first opportunity that we have him at a joint yeah. session. Isber, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Katarina. It's my pleasure to be with you and to share uh, some ideas uh, on uh, the engagement of uh, civil society in, in, in crisis and conflict. So um, I will keep a, a very little short talk about our work uh, within uh, our NGO here, the Short Peace. Uh, and I actually, uh, I am talking especially now about an initiative, uh, an initiative of uh, our organization, which is uh, called ANSH, Arab uh, Network of Civil Society Organization to Safeguard Cultural Heritage. So uh, a very small uh, uh, introduction about Heritage for Peace. We are an, an international group of heritage workers who believe that cultural heritage is a common ground for dialogue and a tool to build peace. Our mission to support uh, heritage workers indifferent of citizenship uh, or, or religion as, uh, as a work uh, towards the production of cultural heritage uh, uh, for future uh, generations. Uh, our work uh, started in 2013 uh, in Syria and uh, we did the first four years of, uh, uh, of, uh, of our work in Syria then with the necessity to extend uh, the work, we 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 started to work in uh, uh, also in other Arab countries in conflict, like Yemen, Iraq, uh, Libya, and recently as well, we uh, we are uh, helping our Ukrainian uh, uh, colleagues on 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 the production of uh, uh, heritage. So, so our uh, the idea is that uh, actually. Uh, 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 came uh, with the uh, 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 with the creation of the Ansh that especially which is something which I would like to highlight in different countries in conflict uh, there is uh, a lot of territories which are uh, uh, under the control of non-state actors so non-state actors means like uh, in, in in Syria Yemen. In Libya, there were uh, like, uh, and still till now, several uh, governments within the same country, which sometimes there are governments which are recognized govern uh, uh, internationally by UNESCO and international law, uh, but there are other uh, governments which are not recognized. So, uh, and those uh, uh, organizations uh, or those governments which are not recognized, uh, they don't really have access to deal with the international community. And especially uh, our work is very concentrated was to support civil society organization in places where there is no recognized governments and non-state actors. So for this reason, uh, we were uh, in contact with uh, uh, several civil society organization in these areas. I, I mean, we work in all the countries uh, uh, and we try to uh, put them in under an umbrella and put them in this umbrella, which is uh, ANSH, uh, uh, Arab Network of Civil Society Organization. So ANSH, was created in 2020 uh, from uh, around, now we have around 40 NGOs from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya. Uh, and also we are open to receive more NGOs who, who came uh, from other countries. Uh, we are concentrated in conflicts uh, area. Uh, so uh, we organize this event where we bring all of those people together with also international uh, 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 funding agency, uh, expert in heritage production, and also uh, authorities. This is something which is very important that in authoritarian or, uh, countries like uh, uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, uh, Libya, Yemen, where there are dictatorships, civil society was uh, not existed before. So, uh, and actually it's a new that civil society was heritage. 
So they, have, they need a lot of uh, 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 support. And uh, even we try to put them in also in uh, the same stage with the authorities of heritage. So uh, uh, and the idea to create and support uh, with them uh, projects which uh, 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 su support their work on the protection of cultural heritage. So uh, uh, our work within uh, Ant and uh, the most important objectives that we are trying to work, sorry, here uh, uh, to create, uh, as I as said, a, a network of civil society organization to identify and define heritage protection projects needed in Arab countries to enhance the visibility of civil society organization, to empower local community participation in the management of cultural heritage and to foster inclusive social and economic development. So uh, we, then we started to implement several projects uh, pilot projects on on heritage production. Uh, uh, these are some of our uh, organization members. So here we have so implemented several projects uh, which are working on on uh, uh, within the umbrella of Ansh. The first one, which is the protection of heritage at places in conflict through digital tools, the role of civil society. So we created an app. I, I will talk about it uh, uh, shortly. COVID guidelines. So this is some projects that we worked within uh, these countries, and we highlighted the, uh, how we can work with civil society in order to uh, 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 to to cope with the COVID crisis with heritage in these countries. Shelter project, which is a Syrian heritage law training, Raqqa project, and Palmyrene Voices Initiative. So basically, the Bacton project, uh, which is the app that we created, it was like a very simple idea, which uh, 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 with this app, uh, it, it, the uh, civil society uh, organizations or and members of uh, local communities, they can use this app to document as well uh, damage and also looted objects of uh, 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 from uh, 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 museums and from uh, archaeological sites. Uh, so with this app, we we started to create some database as well of destruction of looting objects. And we implemented in Syria, so the idea as well to use this app in, in, in uh, also in different uh, uh, areas. So with this app, the people they can document where are uh, the damage, making a photos of the damage very fast without internet. And uh, uh, this is something that sometimes uh, we 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 saw that that we need really uh, to uh, document the damage as soon as uh, as possible. Is there? Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, do you think that in, in one minute it will yeah. be more or less okay? Uh, good. So this is a, okay. another project which is, uh, uh, I, I wrote the website so you can look uh, very in detail to the websites. So Shelter is a project also to engage imams imams in, 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 in the several areas where imams, they are like the, 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 the authorities. So the, the, this project, well, it's a legal project, which we brought, uh, it's a training, which uh, it's, uh, 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 we brought international heritage law, Islamic law and international uh, and national heritage law together and create an e-learning course. This is a project funded by Gerda Henkel uh, Foundation. Uh, so it's also to empower imams to participate on the protection of cultural heritage. Um, again, uh, uh, here we, we worked as well in, uh, in Raqqa, which was the uh, uh, capital of Islamic State. And we, uh, with the people, we did several training and we uh, tried to document all the damage and in making interventions to uh, uh, emergency interventions. Uh, lastly, very fast, this is a Palmyrene Voices initiative. Everyone talk about Palmyra, destruction of Palmyra, but nobody was talking about the people. So this was a, a, an initiative created to support the refugees in, in diaspora, in which them, the Palmyrene Voices can have the voice as well in the destruction of Palmyra, and to empower them through creating uh, income generating project with uh, handicrafts. So the Palmyrene people, they can uh, 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 sell and uh, uh, make income of their uh, of their uh, handicrafts. With this initiative, there is a shop 
which is a, a digital market for the refugees uh, uh, with the handicrafts from Palmyra. So that is uh, uh, all. Thank you very much. Definitely, we should uh, make a follow-up event. I'm, I'm sure there's so, so many uh, great ideas uh, we can uh, expand. Thank you. Our last speaker is uh, Stefania Economou, uh, political scientist. Uh, Stefania, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Hi, everyone. I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay. So, um, hi everyone again. I'm Stefania Economou and I work at Web to Learn with Katerina Juru. This talk is a contribution to the overall theme of Europeana's conference, Make Digital Culture Count. Citizen engagement is a driver of digital culture and therefore we emphasize social participation uh, in shaping digital culture. I, I was also very interested in, in hearing Isber's talk about the role of communities in uh, cultural heritage preservation in the Arab world. Our presentation builds on his first talk, but in a different geographical area because we're focusing on Ukraine. So to make this presentation more concrete, we explore how citizens, everyday people and professionals were engaged in preserving and safeguarding Ukrainian cultural heritage. But first of all, let me explain how we got here. Since February 2022 and the outbreak of the war, we became interested in exploring ways in which citizen communities could work together to help preserve Ukrainian cultural heritage. And to better understand these dynamics, on June 2022, we organized a, web a webinar in which we raised the issue of citizen engagement in cultural heritage protection and preservation in Ukraine, along with researchers and professionals working in the European and Ukrainian cultural sector. Then in July, with Benderilia B, Jovanka Gulikoska, and Katerina Zuru, we participated in a hackathon uh, for humanitarian support to Ukraine that was organized by the European Agency for the Space Program, in which we were awarded the second place for our challenge on cultural heritage under threat. So today's talk is an important milestone in our work on this topic. And by the end of the year, we will also release an online resource uh, in the context of the ICRAN project. So in which ways is citizen engagement from Ukrainian cultural heritage preservation manifested? How citizens, academic staff, and cultural heritage networks come together to strengthen cultural heritage preservation and protection in situations of crisis? Through our research, we have identified and categorized citizen engagement actions in four groups. Those who adopt, uh, that adopt open innovation practices, uh, actions by European cultural heritage networks, museum-driven initiatives, and citizen-based actions. So the first group uh, belongs to the open innovation uh, element. Open innovation is an umbrella term that covers actions like hackathons, crowdfunding, maker spaces, and fab labs. Open innovation is about communities of enthusiasts who come together and use any sort of technologies, including do-it-yourself style tools for their social purpose. So in our collection, we have spotted two hackathons that address the Ukrainian community needs. Uh, hackathons are quick two-day events uh, that bring together people who want to solve the problem and the best solutions are awarded. Uh, the one hackathon is the one that Bende was referring to earlier. It was organized by the European Agency for the Space Program. And the other hackathon was organized by higher education students of the Warsaw University of Technology and Imperial College London. The aim of both hackathons was to develop digital solutions for Ukrainian citizens to cover various social purposes and needs, including cultural heritage. Then we have uh, two initiatives and then actions that focus exclusively on cultural heritage preservation. Backup Ukraine is such an initiative. Um, here, Ukrainian citizens scanned uh, monuments in Ukraine through their phones uh, by using a mobile app. Uh, these images were then uh, produced as 3D models and stored in an open access archive. Uh, the second, uh, the, the, the fourth, uh, sorry, the fourth initiative that you may already be aware of because of uh, the Sebastian Maestorovic uh, European Conference talk yesterday is SUCHO, uh, Saving Ukrainian Culture Heritage Online. Um, SUCHO was set up by a group of higher education staff and researchers 
and here volunteers coming from different professional backgrounds uh, are saving by archiving digital content uh, and data of Ukrainian cultural heritage institutions. This action has grown exponentially and now it counts over 1,500 volunteers that have preserved more than 50 terabytes of data. The second group of actions includes uh, actions by European cultural heritage networks. These actions were designed to foster citizen engagement in Ukrainian cultural heritage preservation as they propagated calls for actions from all around Europe and Ukraine. <laughs> from our research, we have spotted three exemplary actions by Europe European cultural heritage networks. Uh, the one is from the European Creatives Hub Network. The network has set up an online platform for Ukraine in which citizens could register their support actions, which were then uploaded to the network's platform. Uh, NEMO, the network of European museum organizations, had also engaged in similar action. NEMO was particularly active in collecting and monitoring actions in support of the Ukrainian cultural sector in a dedicated page in its website. Another popular initiative is the one launched by the Cultural Action Europe Network, known as Culture for Ukraine. The network set up a digital space in which citizens register their actions in support of the Ukrainian cultural heritage sector and its people. The third group presents citizen engagement actions uh, by museums. Thanks to their uh, staff members, cultural heritage professionals and ordinary visitors, museums in Ukraine and Europe were able to sustain efforts on Ukrainian cultural heritage preservation. In Ukraine, we have identified an important initiative known as HERI, Heritage Emergency Response Initiative. HERI was set up by Ukrainian museums and NGOs to preserve Ukrainian cultural heritage during the war, as well as guarantee its restoration in the post-conflict era. Uh, HERI's work is supported by donations from abroad that enable HERI to acquire the necessary protective equipment to be distributed in museums across the country. In the Baltic region, the one most affected by the war in Ukraine, we identified actions organized by the Modern Museum in Lithuania. Uh, its actions range from crowdfunding campaigns to collecting books from chil for children. Uh, thanks to the active involvement of its uh, visitors, uh, the Mo Museum could provide much needed support to the Ukrainian refugees in the country. And the last fourth group includes participatory citizen engagement actions the ones in which citizen contribution is even more direct and engaging. In this context, we came across the activities of the Lviv Open Lab in Ukraine. This lab is a youth space that encourages young participants to create camouflage nets. Participants collected the necessary materials through crowdsourcing. And just to say that crowdsourcing is a practice that involves a group of people who contribute to the creation of a product or a service. So in the same token, we have also spotted another action, which is also based on crowdsourcing. Uh, it's the Translate the Story Ukraine Initiative, organized and launched by UNESCO in partnership with important organizations. The goal here is to translate 100 early grade books into Ukrainian through crowdsourcing. In other words, volunteers from around the world coming together through digital technology to engage in translating stories for children in Ukrainian language. So after this identification of resources and actions, what comes next? All these interesting actions have been gathered so that we produced a digital showcase. And this collection is openly uh, open access and available on GitHub. Moreover, uh, this collection has been uh, developed in an educational resource that will be released on winter 2022. This learning resource is meant to serve professionals of the cultural sector who wish to expand their knowledge on open innovation as a crisis response. It is a result of the EU-funded Echoing project. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Stefania. Uh, time for two questions from the audience, please. Uh, Yolan, uh, I know we have uh, six minutes. Thank you, indeed. <laughs> either on the chat, please, or by grabbing the microphone. If there's no direct questions from the audience, I can start off with one, but I do want to first wait a please. second to see unless there's any other questions. 
great. Um, uh, thank you all. Um, this was a lot of information to process, which I'm still doing, uh, but but it was very interesting to see the differences and similarities in the different projects that you're all working in that in one way or another, try to um, work towards the same goal, but in, uh, in different uh, areas, uh, using different pieces of technology um, and so forth. I've, I've heard a few talks um, mention crowdsourcing, uh, mention citizen science and involving um, European citizens, citizens in general, in your research work. Um, my question for, I, I guess, all of you would be if um, if there's any people in, in this session that are inspired to try and support you or help you um, in any way they could, um, where would you point them? Where would they start? And um, maybe also what kind of expertise or what kind of people are you looking for to help you in your work? Um, anyone can, can can start answering and I think we'll go from there. Then to go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, for, if if you as a uh, individual, as a citizen, you mean, uh, right? How can you engage in this? Uh, there are many different ways. Um, if you are not sure exactly where you wanna, you know, what topic you wanna contribute with or engaging, etc., you can go to the European uh, Citizen Science Association and find many uh, partners and many, many individuals with different expertise and different perspectives on citizen science there. And you can also, if you are interested in, um, uh, in apps or, or more on the technical side, uh, for instance, this uh, in Ukraine, if you're in Ukraine, there are um, this, um, uh, sensor nets or the nets that I, I actually showed is just contact them. So citizen science in general is very easy to get involved in because you are welcomed by everybody, I can assure. When we use the term citizen cartographer in our mm -hmm. presentation, I, it gave me pause. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. No worries. So citizen cartographer, Alex. Yeah, when we use this term uh, in our presentation and, and other documentation, it gave me pause of whether that was really the term we should use, because very often, you know, immediately the, the term citizen communicates a particularly empowered, politically empowered person mm. who operates within uh, kind of a sovereignty sphere, right? Uh, and we know that there are refugees, asylees, mm. Uh, individuals who would not be citizens, uh, neither in the formal sense, uh, uh, nor even in the kind of colloquial sense. And I think this is something that we need, in a community sense, figure out, right, of how to in be inclusive, uh, targeting obviously those who are politically empowered through their citizen uh, status, and may have access to resources that would enable them to, uh, you know, identify a site, like we said, as I said earlier, or um, uh, gather data, then report it, and, and, and so on. Uh, how do we dilate out from that core group? And I don't have the answer to that. And that's what I would like to kind of focus on. I want to start rattling off different things. But for me, this is a huge question. Fascinating answer. Thank you, Alex. Um, thanks for, for opening our eyes of, of yeah, as you said, that the specificity of the word citizen, where maybe what we mostly mean instead of someone with citizen status, it is more about someone that is not the entrenched research specialist, but does want to support. And um, But by using that word, we're invalidating people that... Um, are not seen as citizens as such. So actually what we mean is people, but um, maybe we should just use use that word or, or that may be too simple. Anyway, th those are my reflections. But um, Stephanie, I saw you uh, nodding along a lot. Do you agree? Anything you want to add? I see Alex's point about citizens and who is the, has the right to be called like that. But what I would like to point to about the citizens engagement on these initiatives uh, and actions from our, my perspective and thanks to the research we have done with Katerina is that everyone is welcome to contribute, even in uh, 
initiatives that are more demanding in terms of uh, skills like uh, archiving, digital archiving, etc. I saw that uh, we have observed that uh, our research groups and uh, staff involved there have provide uh, guidelines and tutorials and meetings with the volunteers so that everyone can really uh, come to this project and contribute the, in every way possible. So don't be afraid of, afraid of being engaged and uh, begin to uh, be involved in the, such activities. That's all for me. Thank you, Stefania. I see that we're almost at time. So I will uh, throw it back to Katarina one last time to close the session and then uh, we will go to the next session from there. Katarina, please. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for being uh, fast in, and in responding to, to the call, uh, to Jolan for also adjusting us uh, and also to, to, to the audience. It has been a panorama of uh, different views and we, we intend to, to keep the conversation ongoing. Thank you very much all. Let's move to the next session.